With Assassin's Creed Shadows on the horizon, I thought it would be a pretty cool idea to focus on the current Assassin's Creed game and that is Assassin's Creed Mirage. Now this is a game that really took me back to the days when this franchise did not have hundreds of hours of content and the world was not so giant that you needed to travel on a ship to get from point A to point B. I'm not saying the newer style is bad, I love it, but this is a refreshing change and a clear nod to the pre-RPG era. When this game was in development, the phrase back to its roots was tossed around a lot. In fact, it was tossed around a bit too much, not just by the actual developers of the game, but also fans themselves. Mirage is a game created by Ubisoft Bordeaux, a studio not many people are familiar with. We're used to Ubisoft Montreal and Ubisoft Quebec. In fact, you gotta tip your hat to Ubisoft Bordeaux, because they developed Assassin's Creed Mirage with a significantly lower budget than any of the other studios that developed the bigger Assassin's Creed titles. There was also a studio with only around 400 developers. To put that into just how small that is, Ubisoft Montreal who developed Origins, Valhalla, Unity and many other mainline games have a total of over 4,000 developers. That's a 900% increase in workload. So just off that, I do wonder what Ubisoft Bordeaux can do with a higher budget and whatnot. Anyway that's enough about the game's background. Let's actually dive into the juicy stuff. Now just real quick before I delve into it, if you do enjoy this video, do consider hitting that subscribe subscribe button. My goal is 100k and I don't know if that's possible to hit by the start of 2025. Who knows? Anyway, let's get into it. After seeing and playing the RPG era Assassin's Creed games, a lot of people were pretty skeptical on how the size of Mirage's world would turn out. Would it be stupidly large or would it be quite small? Well, the answer is neither. It's a pretty well sizable map and the depiction of 9th century Baghdad is quite stunning. It's the type of setting we have not seen since probably the Ezio trilogy. I guess you could also count Unity and Syndicate but I don't really see it. If you are an OG fan and enjoy the smaller scale cities then I believe you'd have a great time exploring and parkouring around the streets of Baghdad in this game. Also, if you're a fan of Origins, then there are a few similarities with ancient Baghdad to ancient Egypt. And no, it's not just the desert itself. It's the colour palette, the layout of buildings, the atmosphere. It's very reminiscent of some of the cities and towns in Origins. That could just be me though. Ubisoft Bordeaux have taken a much appreciated approach to removing the bloat from the map, something that's clearly present in games like Unity and mostly Odyssey. It's a change of pace to not encounter an enemy camp or an enemy fortress every few meters when moving around, which was something that was quite prevalent in the past three games. With Baghdad in this game, it features several distinct districts. Abbasia, the cultural hub which is full of scholars, scientists and philosophers. Then there's Kark which is the market district. This certain district is the busiest and also the most densely populated district and is essentially the industrial centre full of NPCs and market stalls. Then there's the Harbia district which is a more downtrodden area where the less fortunate such as slaves, orphans and those with limited means barely get by. And last but not least there is the round city of Baghdad, a district that serves as the seat of power for the region. Apart from Baghdad, the game also takes you to Alamut, the fortress of the hidden ones, though you'll find that this particular area in the game is not as large as Baghdad. In fact, Alamo Castle is still under construction during the game's time period. It is pretty stupid that you cannot travel back to Alamo after the story is finished, which I thought was straight up silly by Ubisoft. Now apart from the populated locations in Mirage, there is also the desert that you can explore, but I wouldn't really recommend it as there is quite literally barely anything to do out there. In fact the desert is more so for the point of travelling from point A to point B and just getting to your destination. There is also an Isu site out there but to avoid spoilers, I won't elaborate more on that. But overall the setting of Assassin's Creed Mirage for me is a personal 7 or 8 out of 10. When it comes to the story of Assassin's Creed Mirage, I'll go over it without spoiling anything. So essentially you play as Basim ibn Ishaq, a character that has a very mysterious past and an important role in the Assassin's Creed universe. We get to witness Basim's transformation from a street thief to a master assassin. The story pretty much dives into his personal struggles and also his journey for answers about his past. We'll become an assassin and essentially attempt to free 9th century Baghdad by eliminating a hierarchy of progressively more evil enemies, all in the middle of some pretty important political turmoil. You know, it's got the typical Order of Ancients slash Templar stuff. This is pretty much the plot of most Assassin's Creed games. If I'm being honest, the story is not anything to write home about. It's not a story that I'll remember in 10 years time. The same way I remember the entirety of Ezio's story from his trilogy, or even Edward Kenway's. If anything, it's far from those stories. It was a tale that did its job. Choosing Basim as a protagonist is a bit of a tricky one, especially when trying to write a story. Basim showed up as a pretty important character in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and the fact that this game kind of serves as a sequel or a prequel, depending on how 
how you look at it meant it had to stand on its own. I won't say anything about Assassin's Creed Valhalla's story as I would spoil it, but Basim as a character is a pretty decent one. Would I want to follow up for his character? Absolutely not. He's a 6 out of 10 or a 7 out of 10 character, but that's purely my opinion. I can respect that Basim as a character is very dedicated to Creed, and that's what Assassin's Creed is all about. Also, the fact that Mirage takes place in a smaller scale map such as Baghdad helps the plot quite a bit, since the story quests are all confined to one single city. Oh, and if you're wondering if this game featured anything animus or modern day related, the answer to that is no. In fact, this game just abandoned it entirely for some reason. Although, there was a piece of cut content related to the modern day, so make of that what you will. In terms of side characters, to put it as honestly as possible, they were very forgettable, except for Rashan. But other than her, the rest of them have no interesting backstory, they have no personality, and there's no engaging story to them. They just dare to fill in the blanks. So overall, the story could have been better, but it did a decent job at what it wanted to be. If you wanted a very, and I mean very standard Assassin's Creed story, then this is it. Also, if you have not played Valhalla, I do recommend playing that just so you can make Mirage's story a bit more manageable. Now when it comes to combat and what to expect in this game, I'll be very honest with you and say combat is probably the weakest pillar out of combat, parkour and stealth. The combat in Assassin's Creed Mirage has its ups and downs. Since this game was initially planned as a DLC for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, don't expect the combat to resemble that of Unity, Syndicate or even the Ezio trilogy. The combat here is quite similar to what you experienced in Valhalla. On the one hand, it sticks to some familiar mechanics from previous Assassin's Creed games, which can feel a bit clunky and outdated. When you find yourself in a one-on-one -on -one fight, you pull out your sword and have the options to land light and heavy blows, dodge or parry. Parrying can essentially daze enemies making them vulnerable to an instant kill. However, there's a bit of a letdown with how enemies react or don't react to your attacks, which can be a bit annoying. The combat animations look pretty cool, but it lacks that satisfying flow of past games, where you could chain together parry kill combos like in the Arkham series. Enemies in Mirage hit a lot harder, and Basim is much more vulnerable, making him quite fragile. So relying solely on hitbox combat is not the best strategy. This game's combat encourages you to think smart, use your tools and plan your moves strategically. And speaking of tools, I'll go over that a bit more in depth later in this video. While you'll still see familiar elements like health bars, dodging encounters, some things have changed for the better. For instance, damage numbers and level gating are gone. Enemies will attack you quickly and at the same time, dealing a lot of damage. It is pretty tough to dodge or parry every attack coming from different directions all at once. Charging into a fight without a plan often leaves you overwhelmed by multiple guards. So precision in dodging, countering and parrying is pretty important. You will still face unblockable red attacks from enemies, requiring perfectly timed dodges that use up stamina. Yellow highlighted enemies signal the right moment to parry with your dagger, allowing you to counter attack and break their defenses. Now one new feature is the assassin focus, which lets you stop time and pick several enemies to kill in a row without taking damage. The catch is that the focus bar only refills when you stealthily assassinate people. Now personally, I tried this a few times, I forgot about it and just ended up not using it again. I found myself relying more on traditional style kills instead of turning into some teleporting superhero. And that brings me on to stealth. Now stealth in this game is in my opinion the strongest pillar out of combat, stealth and parkour, and by far as well. I didn't really expect a once Valhalla DLC turned mainline game to have one of the best stealth systems in the entire franchise, so credit to Ubisoft Bordeaux for that. Now sure, the stealth is definitely not on the level of a game like Splinter Cell or Dishonored. Those are games that I class at the pinnacle of what stealth is meant to be, but it's still great regardless. What really stands out in Mirage is the return of social stealth, blending into crowds and using them to move undetected to your objective brings a whole new dimension to the gameplay. Now right from the beginning of the game, Basim can hide in grass, bushes and haystacks, taking down enemies quietly one by one. He can also whistle to distract them and use throwing knives for swift eliminations. As we progress throughout the game, we're able to expand the options for Basim. Certain skills allow him to chain assassinations and the assassin's focus ability lets him take out small groups of guards pretty quickly. But as I said earlier, this ability was not exactly something I would use that often. Additionally, other skills unlock more tools like smoke bombs and darts, which can be upgraded to provide even more versatility in your stealth approach. This game also featured the ability to pickpocket random civilians and NPCs, something we haven't seen for a while in this franchise. You know, I think the last time we saw this was one of the SEO games, if I'm not mistaken. So, how it works is you'd approach a random 
random person from behind and a quick time event will occur. Timing here is very important and if you're playing this game on the normal difficulty or lower then this is not really a challenge at all. In fact it's quite hard to fail. But let's say you are playing on the hardest difficulty. The timing window to successfully pickpocket is much less apparent. There are also plenty of other stealth options available in the game. You can hire random groups of people to create distractions. There are more hiding spots such as gazebos and if you time your attacks correctly you can take out enemies in plain sight honestly without drawing any attention to Basim. It's a stealth system that really gives me the classic brotherhood or unity vibe but I would even say some aspects are improved on from those games. You can execute perfectly timed assassinations from haystacks or behind cover and move the body back to where you are. You can jump down from buildings onto enemies, assassinate enemies over walls from behind and use all the tools you need to escape such as smoke bombs. And speaking of tools, Basim has a variety of them at his disposal to aid in his stealth endeavours. Starting with the basics, there's a torch, which is pretty straightforward but essential. The blow dart is a silent projectile that can instantly incapacitate targets, perfect for quiet takedowns or long range attacks. You're also able to upgrade it to apply poison or induce a fit of rage, making it even more versatile. The smoke bomb is of course a tool but this time deploying red smoke instead of white. It can be used both defensively and offensively, helping you cover your tracks or confuse your enemies. The throwing knife is a versatile tool for accurate long distance eliminations and can be visually upgraded with better materials or alchemical properties for added lethality. The noise maker is incredibly useful for drawing enemies to a specific location, diverting their attention away from you. And lastly there's the trap which is a small proximity explosive that can be upgraded to release poisonous gas, eliminating any enemies within its radius. I do believe this is also the first time placeable traps have appeared in the Assassin's Creed series. What's great is that all of these tools can be upgraded throughout your Assassin Bureau, allowing for much better customization in your stealth abilities. And that leaves me with the last pillar which is parkour. Now I'm going to leave this one short as there is not much to discuss when talking about the parkour in this game. It was clearly not the focus when this game was being developed and it definitely shows, especially with the updates Ubisoft have been releasing in order to fix, yes fix parkour in this game. You see in the Altair and Ezio era, parkour was not the fastest but it gave you a sense of control and it was a lot of fun, essentially a great way to move from point A to point B. That's why when I rank all of the parkour systems in this franchise, I place one of the older games as the number one spot because of how fun and freedom heavy it felt. In Mirage however, parkour feels very bland and somewhat out of control. If you played Valhalla, then you'd realise that the parkour is almost identical to that of what Evo, a viking, would be able to do. Often, it's pretty unclear when Basim is sprinting or which surfaces are climbable. There are moments when you can't jump gaps that previous characters could easily clear. When you're not attempting anything flashy and just want to reach the top of a building, parkour can work fine. But the inconsistency in mechanics such as side ejects can be pretty annoying. In fact, I can barely remember doing side ejects in this game. And no, that's not a skill issue. It's just a very inconsistent aspect of parkour in this game. Sometimes Basim jumps to the platform next to him as intended, but other times he just moves to the side or does not react at all. Even the parkour down, which shares the same button as crouching, most of the time when you try to smoothly parkour down an area, Basim will simply crouch at the edge of the roof instead. You know the only positive I can really give about the parkour in this game is Baghdad and how dense it is which makes parkour somewhat there I guess. The customization that is presented to you in Assassin's Creed Mirage is more on the simple level. Since this game is not an RPG game, the inventory, gear customization and overall menus are a lot more simplified. When it comes to your gear, you have your outfits. There are quite a decent amount to collect in the game and each one not only looks unique but also provides specific perks. For instance, the initiate of Alamo outfit makes assassinations quieter while the hidden ones outfit boosts your focus. The costume section relates to your appearance and are purely cosmetic. These costumes alter your look without impacting the perks of your current outfit. My personal favourite is the white patient robe. It's a costume that doesn't relate to an assassin but it's so clean. The outfit dye is as the name suggests. You can dye your outfits. However, these dyes are locked to certain outfits with each dye you get only being available for a certain outfit you choose. The talismans are purely cosmetic items that you can find in the game and they don't have any impact on Basim's abilities. The sword is of course your sword, it's your main hand weapon and it's what you deal damage with. Daggers however are a unique weapon type in Assassin's Creed Mirage. These small blades are perfect for slicing through enemies and offer unique perks for Basim. They do deal less damage than swords but the advantage is that they are highly efficient and ideal for faster combat styles. The skill tree is very simplified and is split into three sections, Phantom, Trickster and Predator. Phantom is all about Basim's assassin skills with abilities like Breakfall to help him land safely and Chain Assassination to quickly take down a a second enemy right after the first, whether
together in close combat or with throwing knives. Trickster focuses on improving Basim's tool use, giving you perks like automatic looting, an extra tool slot, and better pickpocketing abilities. Predator improves Basim's perception and sight through his eagle companion in Kidu, opening up more opportunities when you see the world through Kidu's eyes. Oh, and there is a handy feature that lets you reset all of your skills, so you can try new abilities without being stuck with your old choices. The side content in Assassin's Creed Mirage is, in my opinion, one of the weaker parts of this game. It did seem like Ubisoft Bordeaux really put most of the effort into the story and Baghdad instead of the side content. That's not me saying there is none, there's just not much. You could obtain artifacts for a side character named Davis. It's a bit repetitive if I'm being honest and not really rewarding at all. There is also another piece of side content that allows you to obtain 6 lost books, with the 7th one being a secret one. It is a decent questline and it rewards you with a nice costume. You could solve enigmas which I don't think anyone on this planet would want to do. If you're a completionist then I guess this is for you. There's Tales of Baghdad which are Mirage's version of side quests, but these are so incredibly forgettable that they're just not worth doing in my opinion. There is no good rewards. The story stories are boring and it's a bit forced. There's contracts which are probably the best piece of side content in this game, but that's not really saying much after what I just described. These contracts can be found on boards in the Assassin Bureau, and these missions vary from assassinations to item retrievals and help you hone your skills as a master assassin. The variety of these missions keep them interesting and they're a great way to build your reputation in Baghdad. And last but not least, there's an e-suicide mission that involves finding some mysterious shards. The rewards for this are pretty cool I won't lie, so I do recommend doing that if you like the e-suicide of this franchise. When it comes to if this game has any replay value, the answer is yes. In fact, I would have said no, but since Ubisoft released an update for Mirage that features some good things, now it's definitely replayable. Just having the option to skip the intro tutorial and jump straight into Baghdad in New Game Plus is a fantastic feature. It saves a lot of time, unless you dive back into the action immediately. The main feature for replay value is the permadeath mode. Now this mode changes everything, knowing that your journey can end from just dying once or committing illegal actions, adds a layer of intensity and strategy to every move that you do. You have to carefully plan your approach to combat, stealth and missions, making each playthrough feel fresh and challenging. The stealth of Mirage also is another reason why this game is quite replayable. The setting of Baghdad is perfect for seeking around, and the stealth mechanics are so well tuned that they make replaying the game enjoyable. So overall, the replay value for Assassin's Creed Mirage is definitely there, and if you're interested in playing this game, you can also play it again whenever you like without feeling like you're doing the same thing. Now this part of the video is pretty important, and if you decide to play this game on a controller, then I feel like you need to know this. So Mirage's control scheme for controller players is very strange. In fact, it's completely different than the old school controls we're all used to. It's weird because the sprint button is mapped to the L3 button, while Eagle Vision is assigned to the left on the D-pad. It's just a total mess. Well, the good thing about this game is that they give you the option to change the controller scheme to what you want, and I'm going to give you what I believe is the best controller binds for this game. So you want to bind the sprint button from L3 to holding on too, which is exactly like it is in the older games. Also you want to assign the tools wheel to the d-pad. I went with the bottom d-pad which fits perfectly with what I want. So in summary just make sure the sprint button is not L3, because that makes no sense, especially for an Assassin's Creed game. But at the end of the day, it's all personal preference. So we're now at the end of the video. Should you play Assassin's Creed Mirage in 2024 or whenever you're watching this? The answer is an absolute yes. Give it a try. It's a pretty decent game that does its job. If you need a game to play whilst waiting for something major like Grand Theft Auto 6, then it would not hurt to try this game. The issues that I have with this game are mainly development issues such as mocap, lack of side content and just a bit of a snooze fest story. But that's just my personal opinion. I know there are a lot of people that love this game and I'm glad people do. So yeah, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button and with that said, I'll see you in the next one.